recording and we're going live in just a second. Give it a moment. <laughs> and you're ready. Thank you. So, bonjour tout le monde. Welcome everybody. Bon dia, or maybe evening where you are, uh, or who knows what time of day. Uh, I'm Monica Heller. I'm at the University of Toronto in Canada. And I'm going to be the animatrice for today's joint Anthropen uh, WCAA seminar on something that we've been playing around with how to call it, minorization, minoritization, something processual around the concept of some idea of minority. What we are trying to do is to look at not minorities as an object, but rather what the social processes are and what the ideas are around why we think about such things um, in the first place at all. So we have four guests today, Claudia Fonseca from Brazil, Alexandre Duchenne from Switzerland, Lionel Wee from Singapore and Kifan from China. And I'm not gonna say much more, I'm going to go straight to um, our first presenter. I'll introduce each one of them in turn. So our first participant is Claudia Fonseca, who is Professor of Anthropology at the Universidade Federal de Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Her research interests include government technology, feminist studies, and the anthropology of science and technology. In addition to long-term involvement in the field of child protection, she's conducted recent research on leprosy, examining health, issues of health, care, patient activism, stigma, and disability. She's currently developing research on techno norms, that's her term, looking at the use of scientific languages in the promotion of particular political and moral agendas. Claudia, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to, first of all, uh, share my screen if that's all right with you all. Can we see this now? Yes, perfect. Oh, great. Um, here. So I want to thank you, Monica, Dorothy, uh, everybody for organizing this panel from the WCAA and for the opportunity together with my colleagues to think through the implications of this word minorization. You know, minority, as we use it in our day-to-day -day language, has to do with oppressed groups, the discriminated against, the politically disenfranchised, and uh, these, uh, the people for the last couple of decades have been the object of affirmative action pro policies. Blacks, Indigenous people, and more recently, the disabled, transsexuals, and so on. There's no doubt in my mind that these are important policies. However, I want to insist on the gains of the term chosen for this panel, minoritization. The suffix isation puts us in dialogue with a whole slew of analysts trying to denaturalize set ideas that underwrite the common sense use of certain words. The ization reminds us that notions are formed as the result of historical processes and power plays occurring both before and after the events they pretend to describe. In this sense, we could say minorities are made, not born. As we follow on this line of analysis, the shift from minority to minorization points us in rather exciting directions our basic task becomes to investigate not what or who can, constitutes a minority, but of how certain historical processes lead up to the minorization of given categories. Now, I'll start to begin with, it's pretty obvious that minorities cannot be defined solely by their inferior numbers. If not, we'd be treating financial millionaires as a minority. However, Numbers might tell us something about the political processes of minorization. Take, for example, Brazil's indigenous population killed off by war and disease brought in by the country's European colonizers. The native peoples went from over 3 million 
at the time of conquest to one fifth that number barely 100 years later before going into a still more giddy decline. One might say this minority was forged through brute force. However, a curious thing has happened of late. A population that had diminished to virtually nothing underwent demographic explosion, vaulting from 70,000 in 1957 to nearly 900,000 in 2022. That's right. In the past 70 years, Brazil's indigenous population has multiplied to over 12 times its previous count. Now, since indigenous peoples are hardly more fertile than the rest of the population, we are forced to look elsewhere to understand reverse trends. How can we ignore that the amazing ethnogenesis of indigenous populations took off at the end of the military dictatorship, just as the country's 1988 constitution recognized the First Nations, established auto-determination and the right to their collective lands. People who had previously hidden or underplayed their origins began, began to proudly proclaim their indigenous roots. It would seem that minority status is not determined simply by numbers, rather the diminished size of a minority group is more likely a result than a cause in its low political status. Now, let's look how we forge majority. We should take a quick, brief look at the work invested in this majority. During the colonial period, the government made persistent efforts to downplay the slave rebellions and to present Brazil as a civilized nation despite the country's overwhelming proportion of Blacks. This led to various policies aimed at whitening the population. One tactic was to encourage European immigration through special incentives, such as land and subsidies. But perhaps still more effective was the practice of classifying offspring born of mixed racial parentage, whether the fruit of rape or intermarriage, not as black, but as caboclo, pardo, or other fuzzy terms. Despite oh, all the Dalia, excuse me. Yes. Uh, yes. are, are there slides? The slides are not shifting on our screen. Oh, dear me. Oh, thank you so much for telling me. Uh, can you see that now or not? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, dear. All right. All right. Well, let's just go down. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so another tactic besides uh, heavy human incentives for European immigration was uh, declaring the offspring of mixed marriages widened. Um, despite all, the country's first official census in 1872 and 1890 made it clear that non-whites were still in the majority. Interestingly enough, color simply dropped out of the democratic census for the next few decades, perhaps as a way to nurture the illusion of a whitened Brazil. However, by 1940, when racial identity once again entered into official data, it would appear that the hopeful predictions had finally come true. Brazil's colored population had shrunk to a mere 35%. However, just as in the case of the indigenous populations, only on a still greater scale, the number of people classified in the category of black and mixed race began to multiply at the end of the last century, catching up and by 2007, surpassing the number of whites. Whoops. Researchers insist that the observed increase in the percentage of blacks in the country was due almost exclusively to the change that occurred in the way people see themselves. The climate of liberal democracy crowned by 12 years of a leftist regime and the expansion of policies for affirmative action together with virgin and burgeoning social movement transformed for many the connotation of racial minority from a handicap to an advantage. Uh, But even if we agree that minorities are not a product of national history, 
that they are made not for, and minorization is part and parcel of the logic of colonial hier hierarchies. The question remains, what are the implements used to minorize certain groups? A question that brings us to the core of our reasoning. How since the late 1800s, the country's national administration has been geared toward the Pacific integration of non-conformist minorities into the fold of hegemonic political culture. As the central government passed from a strategy of extermination to one of fraternal protection, new agencies and specialists sprung up to decide for the native populations just what was in their best interests. Intermediaries, including anthropologists, were basically charged with providing bridges for assimilation that would legitimize the universalized instruments of government. Laws and public run services spread their net to an ever wider array of less than civilized citizens. In the 1916 civil code, forest dwellers, a polite name for indigenous groups, together with married women and adolescents between 16 and 21, were included in the category of the relatively incompetent, and so placed under the, under the special guardianship of the court of orphans until such time as they adapted to civilization. Minorization in this case describes a pedagogical framework designed to help the minority disappear. Of course, all this was justified by a humanitarian logic that consistently underlined the need of certain categories for special protection, which brings us to a final subject of particular interest to me, how age groups, particularly children and adolescents, figure into the dynamics of minorization. Most of my listeners will be aware of the expression age of majority used to describe the moment at which an individual, an individual accedes to his full legal rights. In Latin America, we have traditionally referred to underage children as minors, a status that under the central state's growing authority demanded specialized professionals and agencies to exercise what was seen as benevolent supervision. Of course, the singling out of children as a group in need of special attention was heralded as a humanitarian advance. Minors in institutional care, okay, let's see if we go here, no, anyway, uh, were to be segregated out and juvenile offenders were to receive lighter, more pedagogical forms of punishment than their adult counter counterparts. Accordingly, these so-called advantages spurred much debate about just when a person should come into his or her majority, at 14, 18, 21. However, even more relevant to our discussion is how, in the name of their tutelary responsibilities, judicial specialists acquired discretionary powers permitting them to ignore a number of routine observances designed to safeguard the rights of a child's originally normally black and poor family. According to the 1927 law, a child who committed a crime could be summarily removed from its parents and placed in institutional care. During ensuing decades, the parents themselves would come under increasing surveillance. If they went to jail, for example, if they were found using drugs, sleeping on the streets, or simply living in miserable conditions, they could be stripped of their parental status. Okay, in other words, as minors in need of special protection, children could be held hostages in the civilizing process of their own families. Most of us are familiar with the history of mission schools, orphanages, and other colonial institutions in which children of native populations were sequestered. Since at least the turn of the millennium, residential care of any sort has fallen out of favor. However, child adoption with its salvationist rhetoric has definitely picked up steam. Today, researchers 
uh, and activists have joined hands to suggest that throughout the Western world, neoliberal governments are acting ever more quickly to forcibly remove children from their poor and mostly black families so that, that they can be adopted into middle class white majority. Specialized professionals at the, oops, here. Specialized professionals in juvenile court authorize the seizure of newborns in the maternity, paternity wards, even before their parents have had time to be guilty of any wrongdoing. I'm sure the irony will not be lost on my audience. That is, it's precisely the enhanced status of children in general, deminorized, so to speak, that is allowed for the intensified minorization of their parents, authorized by a tutelary regime that gives them the right to decide what is best for the children. The judicial authorities exercise their administrative duties to protect and control over and above what the relatively incompetent parents and even their children might think. Now, to finish, let us recapitulate as the role, result of historical processes and power plays, minorities are made, not born. Changes in political status modify the very measures used to classify people in one group or another, accounting for numbers subject to considerable fluctuation. And finally, minorization in the form of paternal protection is a basic implement wielded by government to bring about conformity to mainstream standards and behaviors. If some groups have been able to organize, mustering political clout to attenuate or even revert some of the institutional policies that weigh on them, there are still many, many non-conformist categories that not, do not seem to have reached full citizen status. In this sense, minorization continues alive and well, and we would be well advised to keep talking about it. Thank you. Obrigada, Claudia. So I think what we have here is an intervention. It has ways in which uh, this concept gives us some insights into the anthropology of race, of the state, of colonialism, uh, many different intersecting uh, regimes of, of population control and essentially of, of power. Um, what I want to do now is to pass uh, to Alexandre Duchesne. Apparently, he, he's on an island somewhere of the west of France and with an internet uh, instability. But uh, first, I want to say that what we're entering into, I think, here, we're now passing from the state and a colonial state to a supranational regime, the United Nations. And uh, I'll make a comment parenthetically about one of the things that we're trying to do with this series is to try to innovate uh, in the sort of concept of world anthropologies with multilingualism. So uh, I'll let, if Alexandre is here, I will let him explain um, his approach. Mais d'abord, je vais le présenter. Il est professeur de sociolinguistique à l'Université de Fribourg en Suisse. À l'intersection entre sciences du langage et sciences sociales, ses recherches portent sur le rôle du langage dans la production des différences et des inégalités sociales. Je suis professeur de sociology of language at Fribourg in, in Switzerland, uh, in the intersection between uh, linguistics and social sciences, uh, focusing on the role of language in the production of social differences and social inequalities. Il est membre de la direction de l'Institut de plurilinguisme, responsable de l'équipe Langage et Inégalité à l'UNI et il est éditeur en chef du International Journal of the Sociology of Language. Il coédite avec Deborah Cameron, a series of politics of language at Rutledge. Also, you all need to know that today is his birthday. So, <laughs> Alexandre, um, are you with us? And do you want to say two words about uh, your approach before we show the video? No, la pas. Il a dit, he said he was back. No, he's out. I'm back. I'm out. Oui, no. Oui, t'es là. On t'entend pas.
Okay, so I'm going to see if I can capture badly. Um, so what Alexandre has done is to make a video which focuses on the moment in the United Nations when there was a debate about whether to include minority rights in the Charter of Human Rights. Um, one of the things that this allows us to do is to see a moment where the Soviet bloc and the liberal democratic countries um, are in conflict over their understanding of what the concept of minority and therefore minority rights might be. Uh, and he's also done this um, in the role of a fictive radio reporter. So Ricardo, can you show the video? Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, je vous souhaite la bienvenue dans notre émission radiophonique bilingue Inside the UN, proposée par votre radio Les Nationalismes Unis. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous. I'm so glad to be here today live in our new season of Inside the UN, proposed by your radio broadcast uh, United Nationalism. I am Steve Martin. Uh, je suis Stéphane Martin, and I will comment what will for sure uh, become a sensational debate about minorities, what they are or not, and what rights should be granted to them. Well, it might ring a bell to some of you, et ça vous rappelle probablement quelque chose. En 48, eh bien, j'étais déjà là avec vous pour partager les débats passionné autour de la rédaction, the drafting of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And at the time, a massive, a huge confrontation emerged uh, during the drafting of the Union Declaration between the West and the East. And the object of this agreement was the inclusion of a specific article concerning minority rights. Le Bloc de l'Est, en tête, l'Union Soviétique faisait pression pour ajouter un tel article. It was clear, it was very much in line with their own ideologies and policies on national minorities at the time. La très grande majorité du Bloc du Nord était contre, uh, they were completely against, considering that recognizing minorities in a declaration irait à l'encontre de leur politique assimilationniste and could give rise, rise to groups to constitute themselves as a minority. In the end, clearly the Western Bloc won, and no minority article was included. And as a reminder, voici l'allocution de Madame Roosevelt, alors présidente de la Commission, from the wonderful archive of our bilingual radio, United Nationalism. The United States delegation supported the deletion of Article 31, considering that provision related to rights of minorities had no place in a declaration of human rights. I further point to the decision taken at the Lima Conference in 1938 and reiterated in Chapultepec that minority questions did not exist on the American continent. United States' experience with foreign groups residing within its borders had been happy, assimilation having been emphasized throughout. And here we are today, again at the Commission of Human Rights, some 15 years later, discussing and debating once again an article on minorities. Mais pourquoi, me direz-vous Eh bien, tout simplement parce que les conditions ont changé. To, today, we are not debating on the drafting of a declaration, which, as you know, is nice to have, but have only some symbolic dimension. Today, we are discussing the drafting of a covenant on civil and political rights. A covenant is a binding instrument, and you can imagine that such a drafting takes a lot of diplomatic skills to make this document acceptable and all the states agreeable. Uh, Mais la raison centrale qui explique que soit rediscuté aujourd'hui un article sur les minorités est en lien direct avec un autre article, celui sur l'autodétermination des peuples, article qui avait été discuté euh, bien plus tôt euh, à la même lors de la même euh, au sein de la même commission. Uh, during that discussion on the article of self-determination, the Western Bloc were clear and eager to limit the rights to form a colonized group and to exclude any groups 
recognized or not in already existing states. And they were clear. Um, it excluded clearly um, existing and new minor minorities to be concerned by the self-determination article. And there we are. Uh, il est donc absolument fondamental d'avoir un article sur les minorités dans le pacte. With the presence of an article separated from the self-determination article, the threat of minorities reclaiming self-determination would be highly reduced. J'espère que vous m'avez suivi. Donc voilà, la question maintenant est de savoir quelle forme doit prendre cet article. Et uh, I can tell you, it will going to be a very, very exciting bras de fer, a very exciting debate that is going to happen today. Alors, que va-t-il se passer durant ces sessions How will the Commission proceed to locate the right article Well, the members have at their disposal three concurring propositions. Alors, la première proposition nous vient de l'Union soviétique. L'Union soviétique a été fortement minorisée dans la plupart des débats qui ont eu lieu autour de la rédaction de ce pacte. Et L'Union soviétique qui propose clairement des droits collectifs, uh, collective rights, actually, that none of the other state representatives want to hear about. And this proposal insists on the responsibilities of the state. Bon, soyons clairs, cette proposition sonne comme un remake, a copy-paste of their own policy on national minorities. The second proposition on the table is drafted uh, by the Yugoslavian Republic. Uh, L'article cherche en quelque sorte une forme de compromis entre l'Est et l'Ouest en s'orientant d'une part vers des droits individuels, every person, but also pointing towards the collective dimension of what constitutes a minority. Positive rights should be granted and the state shall provide protection against discrimination. Les États devront également assurer les mêmes droits euh, aux minorités que les autres euh, citoyens d'un État. And the last proposition comes from the subcommission who was in charge of drafting an article for the covenant. And I can tell you they have taken a lot of time, uh, nearly a decade, to draft this article. De nombreuses discussions houleuses uh, au sein de la sous-commission pour arriver à un article finalement qui met l'accent sur les droits individuels et une formulation par la négative shall not be denied the right. Well, as you can imagine, this proposition was clearly elaborated in order to make it acceptable to most of the state. So now you know everything you need to know uh, and the debates are about to start. Uh, people are sitting down, they are ready to take the floor and I'm happy to follow with you the debates en direct sur notre magnifique radio United Nationalism, Les Nationalismes Unis. Et nous allons directement entrer dans le vif du sujet avec l'intervention euh, du représentant russe, M. Morosov. Donc, voilà M. Morosov qui déploie ses arguments and clearly he is pinpointing where a lot of problem might occur to the western states and other states aligned to the west which is about the collective rights and the implication of the states in creating institutions. Bon, pour vous dire l'ambiance ici, euh, eh bien, du côté du bloc de l'Est, euh, le représentant ukrainien, biélorusse, polonais et tous les autres hein, semblent très, très, très contents de cette allocution. Euh, par contre, du côté du Nord, well, the East, the Western bloc, clearly seems even to be kind of pissed. Well, he is doing everything to piss them off. Uh, sorry for my language. Uh, clairement, uh, il, les, uh, il semble atterré par les propositions de M. Morosov. Et il me semble clair à ce stade que uh, les chances de la proposition Morosov sont uh, quasiment nulles. Et c'est à présent M. Yevremovitch qui prend la parole. He is... Uh, trying to 
defend his uh, own proposal, proposition. Uh, il insiste uh, beaucoup effectivement sur uh, la situation historique et politique de la République yougoslave qui se sent fortement concernée par ces questions uh, de minorité. And he is insisting very much on the fact that minority rights should be actually essential rights granted um, to the people. Uh, well, the audience listened to him very politely. Mais je peux vous dire que euh, elle semble, il semble fortement isolé dans sa proposition. Sa proposition étant probablement la plus euh, contraignante et la plus détaillée, euh, et qu'elle va à l'encontre euh, de nombreuses euh, positions des États euh, dominants. Donc après ces deux allocutions, I can tell you, I can feel some excitement here. In the room, uh, people are asking to take the floor, to make some statements. Um, C'est très intéressant de voir que les gens s'activent beaucoup, se parlent entre eux. Et là où, qu'est-ce que je vois? Oh, maybe, oh, I think this is the Australian representative that is going to take the floor. I guess it is the, okay, let's see. This is an important statement uh, since, as we know, uh, the Aboriginal issue might be uh, part of his statements. Uh, so let's listen to him. Oh my bad, I was wrong. Uh, ce n'est pas le représentant uh, australien, but the representative from Chile. Let's listen to him. So he, Oh, he seems to be a very important voice in Latin America, and of course he is uh, in disagreement with them to propositions that would allocate what he calls uh, super rights. Et c'est très clair que des droits spéciaux posent un certain nombre de problèmes à de très nombreux États. So the Chilean representative just uh, finished his uh, statement. Je vais essayer de vous aider à lire uh, between the line. Uh, il est clair que les critiques sont également uh, adressées à l'égard de la proposition de la sous-commission. Indeed, the subcommission proposition seems to be problematic for some members since it implies that there are minorities in the states, which for many countries, not only in Latin America, but elsewhere too, they do not consider that they have minorities on their territories. Donc, uh, il y a effectivement un problème avec cette uh, proposition et nous allons voir par la suite ce qu'il en est. Mais là, je vois actuellement effectivement le représentant australien qui uh, va prendre immédiatement la parole. Uh, on l'écoute. Oh, toutes mes excuses pour ce problème technique. Uh, you cannot hear the Australian representative, so I'm going to try to give you the essence of uh, his uh, speech. Donc, tout d'abord, il insiste beaucoup sur uh, le fait que l'Australie n'a en fait aucun problème de uh, minorité. Uh, et que également en ce qui concerne la question aborigène, this is a not a minority problem since uh, the problem has been solved successfully through assimilation process. Um, and between the line is also insisting on the fact that we should not create a minority problem where there is no minority problem. So this was a bit in substance what uh, he was uh, proposing today. Um, et je pense que son intervention est effectivement une intervention qui va compter dans les débats. So here we are. The subcommission proposition is also problematic, as you can read between the line of the various interventions today. Uh, et le point le plus problématique eh bien, concerne la question des États qui ne reconnaissent pas l'existence de minorités sur leur territoire. And they might be afraid of the way the article is formulated because, you know, some people could reclaim to be a minority in those states where they're is officially not. So we will see what is going to happen. Uh, a lot of discussions are is going on in the backstage, in the front stage, um, but it's time for us to make a short commercial break and I will keep you posted uh, when I return. Restez avec nous et pour écouter les 
les annonces commerciales. Hello everyone, I'm back. I hope you enjoyed the commercials um, live at the United Nations. Um, a lot of things uh, happened in the meantime. Um, a lot of people were not satisfied by the proposition of the subcommission. And people are debating what wording could be changed. And uh, it sounds quite complicated at this stage. Je ne suis pas du tout certain qu'on trouve un accord, même sur la proposition de la sous-commission. Le problème euh, est vraiment lié au fait que de très nombreux États considèrent qu'il n'existe pas de minorité sur leur territoire. Donc, euh, nous allons voir euh, en détail ce qui pourrait arriver, mais attention, attention. Ouh, là, je vois. Ouh, les choses bougent. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of movements. The Latin American group behind the Chilean, the French, the, even the... United, United States representative seems to have found a kind of agreement. Oh, 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 yeah, that sounds really interesting. Let's see what kind of proposition the Chilean representative is going to come forward. Well, look at this. This is clever. Hey, the Chilean representative proposes to add the following statements in the article in those states in which ethnic religious or linguistic minority exists this was not part of the subcommission proposition dans les états où il existe des minorités ethniques religieuses et linguistiques oh là là ça ça va satisfaire le plus grand nombre ça c'est sûr l'ensemble des pays qui finalement considèrent qu'ils n'ont pas de minorité sur leur territoire et de, donc in fine ça, cet article ne les considère ne pas seront mais ravis de l'adopter. Je pense que uh, the Chilean representative did a really big tour de force here and we can see here live with you inside the UN how such formulation actually led to the satisfaction of the majority of the state representative at the Commission of Human Rights. Well, we will see later on at the assembly what is going to happen but i'm pretty much sure that they will plebiscite this article which actually by the end of the day c'est un article qui n'a aucune contrainte sur aucun des états réunis ne conçoit que des droits négatifs pour les minorités et finalement pour les états où il n'y en a pas selon eux et eh bien ça ne les concerne tout simplement pas je crois que nous avons vécu en direct mesdames et messieurs, un événement euh, intéressant et fascinant des Nations Unies et je vous remercie encore une fois d'avoir été présent aujourd'hui euh, avec moi. Voilà, c'est la fin pour aujourd'hui. I hope you enjoyed that session today with me, uh, debating on what minorities are, who are making them, but also how they are exploited for political purposes. Mon nom est Steve Martin uh, pour uh, les nationalismes unis, la radio bilingue. My name is uh, Stephen uh, Martin for the United Nationalism Bilingual Broadcast. Thanks for listening and choose. Alexandre, je ne sais pas si tu es là. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for, for experimenting with us. Uh, but also for the very serious point that even though we are supposedly in the realm of the universal and the uh, international, we're still dealing with the question of states um, as the primary framework in which to understand the concept of, of minoritization. Um, and I think there's some ways also in which I hope we will be able to discuss further the different uh, the, the sources of the tensions between uh, the West and the East uh, at that time and in, perhaps still today. So we will move to Singapore now. Lionel, are we ready? I'd like to introduce Lionel Wee. 
He is the Provost Chair Professor in the Department of English, Linguistics and Theater Studies at the National University of Singapore. His research interests include language policy, new varieties of English, and general issues in pragmatics and sociolinguistics. He's currently completing with Nora Samosir a book about the Korean wave and the sociolinguistics of soft power, Lionel. Okay, can people hear me? I'm not sure whether I'm being muted or not muted. Okay, so I'll just quickly begin um, to talk about the. Uh, sorry, Ricardo, would you mind sharing the screen for uh, my slides? Okay, then we can move to the second slide, please. Okay. So let me just quickly um, start by saying that uh, as, at least in Singapore, if not elsewhere as well, uh, language is one of the main emblems of uh, identity, especially uh, ethnic and national identities. And in a society like Singapore, which is uh, linguistically and ethically diverse, there are sensitivities about majority and minority ethnic groups. Um, and these sensitivities are part of the history of Singapore, um, and they're also relevant to how Singapore continues to be managed by the government today. So, so uh, in terms of the demographics, as of June uh, 2021, Singapore has about 4 million citizens, and they are officially grouped into four ethnic categories. 75% about them are in Chinese, 15% Malays, 7.5% Indians and the remaining 1.6% officially categorized as others. So the others category is a residual and a heterogeneous category because it contains ethnicities that cannot be easily grouped under the first three. In addition, where language is concerned, the government also recognizes four official languages, English, Mandarin, Malay, and Tamil. Can I have the next slide, please? What the government has tried to do in order to manage the political and cultural sensitivities of the diverse population is to try to ensure that each ethnic group is able to be economically competitive whilst also being able to keep in touch with its heritage. And the solution arrived at by the government is English mother tongue bilingualism. That is, all Singaporeans are encouraged to be bilingual in English and the officially assigned mother tongue. The government encourages uh, competence in English because English is the language of the global economy. It allows access to scientific and technological developments. It is in Singapore the medium of instruction in schools. It is widely used in the media in advertising. And it is also used primarily as an inter-ethnic lingua franca, so for communication across members of different ethnic groups. I'll read out a quote here by Tony Tan, who was Minister of Education in 1986, where he summarizes the rationale for this English mother tongue bilingualism. So the quote goes like this. Our policy of bilingualism that each child should learn English and his mother tongue, I regard as a fundamental feature of our education system. Children must learn English so that they will have a window to the knowledge, technology, and expertise of the modern world. They must know their mother tongues to enable them to know what makes us what we are." End quote. So the government has assigned three official mother tongues for the three ethnic groups. Mandarin is the official mother tongue for Chinese Singaporeans. Malay, the mother tongue for Malay Singaporeans. And Tamil, the mother tongue for Indian Singaporeans. There is no official mother tongue for the others category given its mixed bag status. All the mother tongue languages officially are of equal status. So that despite the fact that Mandarin may be the mother tongue of the majority 
to some numerical terms, more than 75% of the population, all the mother tongues are of equal status. No one mother tongue is to be privileged above any others. Officially then, the result is a language policy where all four languages are of equal status. English, because it's important for economic purposes, and then Mandarin, Malay, and Tamil as the official mother tongues of the various ethnic groups. Can I have the final slide, please? So some points are worth noting and emphasizing. One, there are degrees of minoritization or majoritization here. This is not a binary feature, and certainly it's not an inherent property of a language or an ethnic group. Decisions about the minority or majority status are the results of historical, economic, and political factors, as well as ideologies of language. Let me give some illustrations of this. For example, Singapore in 1963 was part of the Federation of Malaysia, and it worked very hard to be accepted into the Federation because at that time, the government felt that there was no way that Singapore could exist and survive and prosper independently. But the Federation at that time was concerned about accepting Singapore into the Federation because there was a strong Chinese population in Singapore. And the concern was accepting Singapore into the Federation would upset the balance where at that time, the Malays were the majority in the Federation. So in order for Singapore to be accepted in 1963 into the Federation, it had to persuade other potential members, namely Sabah and Sarawak, to also become members at the same time. Because in Sabah and Sarawak, the majority population were Malay speaking. Without Sabah and Sarawak joining at the same time as Singapore, the federal government would be very concerned about upsetting the racial balance by introducing too many Chinese. So when Sabah and Sarawak agreed to join the Federation along with Singapore, the Malays would continue to be the majority group. This was in 1963. But two years later, in 1965, Singapore left the Federation because it was uncomfortable with the Federation's Bumiputra policy, which provided privileges and protections to ethnic Malays. Hence, when Singapore left the Federation and became independent, the government's official commitment was to have equal status for all the mother tongues and English, regardless of the numerical strength of a particular ethnic group. Even so, today, English has been growing in Singapore as a home language, partly because it's the medium of instruction in education, which already in some sense, one could argue, makes it first among equals among the different languages. The widespread use of English has even resulted in the emergence of a nativized variety known as Singlish. And there are concerns that many Singaporeans are shifting to English at expense of their so-called officially assigned mother tongue. And language ideologies here are relevant because of the government's belief that each ethnic group, Chinese or Indian or Malay, each ethnic group must have only one mother tongue. Because the fear is that the linguistic diversity weakens group solidarity. So in the case of Chinese, in order to have Mandarin accepted as the official mother tongue, the government in 1979 embarked on the Speak Mandarin campaign, where attempts were made to eliminate the non-Mandarin Chinese languages. In the case of the Indian community, although Tamil is the official mother tongue, the government took a more tolerant approach and allowed non-Tamil languages to be acceptable as alternatives to Tamil. We can discuss, if necessary, why there's a different way of treating the Indian Singaporean community compared to how they treated the Chinese Singaporean community in terms of mother tongue tolerance. And in Singapore today, hybrid identities still remain an uncomfortable issue. So under the language policy, the mother tongue policy, 
a child is assigned a mother tongue based on the child's ethnic membership. And the child's ethnic membership in turn is arrived at based on the father's ethnicity, not the mother's. So when you have a child of Malay Chinese parentage, then the question is, what does the government do here? Well, the government's current position is that Chinese, Malay Chinese parentage is not the same as Chinese Malay parentage. So the sequence is important. The first member of the hyphenated pair, Malay Chinese or Chinese Malay, is assumed by the government to be the dominant identity. And then based on that dominant identity, the mother tongue is officially assigned. So with that, we are actually back to the original position of each person has one dominant ethnic identity and one unambiguous official mother tongue. So a child of Malay Chinese parentage has to decide whether officially this child wants to be known as Malay Chinese or Chinese Malay because that has consequences for the child's official ethnic membership and official mother tongue. And finally, let me just say something about the current status of Malay in Singapore, the Malay language. Malay in Singapore is also the national language, in addition to being an official mother tongue of the Malay Singaporeans, it is the national language. And there are historically interesting reasons why this happened, because remember in 1963, when Singapore wanted desperately to join the Federation, to assure the Federation that it was very willing to be assimilated, it made Malay the national language of Singapore in anticipation of joining the Federation. When two years later, Singapore left the Federation, the status of Malay as the national language was retained, presumably because there was a concern that revoking that national language status might lead to greater racial unrest and upset. So today in Singapore, Malay remains the national language, but it is hardly used in public life. It is not certainly the medium of instruction in education. You will find it primarily uh, used in the military through military commands and through the singing of the national anthem. So it has a ceremonial usage, which is not quite commensurate with its status as a national language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel. So I think again, we're so we were developing some interesting threads here about uh, the the problem of the nation state as putatively homogeneous uh, and trying to figure out what to do with the bits that don't that don't fit. Uh, some interesting questions about pedagogies of citizenship, the extent to which you can teach through teaching language, for example, the intersections of colonialism, uh, imperialism, nationalism, um, the concept of mother tongue as a kind of ambiguous way of trying to square the circle of the kind of biological understanding of, of citizenship, of nationhood, of race versus the pedagogical um, approach. So we have some threads here, I think, that are developing in an interesting, interesting way across these um, these interventions. So thank you. Um, so the last uh, presentation is by Kifan. He unfortunately, or fortunately for him, is currently at the moment um, teaching. Uh, he's a visiting professor in, in Macau and he's teaching right at this minute. So he has sent us uh, a video. He is head of the Research Institute of Anthropology and professor of sociology at Nanjing University in China. Um, he is, um, uh, he specializes in political anthropology, focusing on issues of ethnicity, nationalism, and identity politics. He did his ethnographic research in some Muslim Hui communities in South Fujian, and has published numerous articles and chapters in both Chinese and English. Recently, he's focused his uh, attention to topics such as globalization, and its future and the anthropology of sport. Uh, Ricardo, can you play his video for us? Ricardo? 
Yes, give me a second. Okay. In the meantime, perhaps I will say that uh, for the discussion afterwards, feel free uh, for those of you who are with us to put um, questions in the chat. Uh, Ricardo and I will try to keep track of them uh, and uh, we may be able to also take them uh, more directly. There's not, there's I think 24 people here. It's relatively manageable. Just give me a second that I'm having an issue here. Oh, here. Uh oh. Oh, yeah, now, now it's solved. Hello, everyone. Give me a second. Oh, sorry, sorry. The sound is terrible. Because of the time conflict, I cannot take part in this event uh, on uh, uh, Thursday evening. So uh, I take a session. Uh, from Professor Hare to make this radio representation. So now I'm going to share my uh, screen. The title of my presentation is Minor, uh, Minorization, Does It Make Sense in China? Okay, here is my out outline. So first, I'm going to talk about the terms, discussing some something about the terms. Then the second one will be uh, criticizing ethnic minority. The third one, the third one actually is a project one, uh, making minority nationalities. And the, the fourth one will be a project project two, making minority nationalities. And the result, of course, I will be uh, talk a little bit. The terms, it will be very crazy if the term minor, minorization uh, translated into Chinese. I have no idea how to do it better. In my understanding, the term means ways people are pushed to age, simply speaking. To understand the term in Chinese, it should be start with examination of notion of minority in Chinese. In Chinese, the term for minority is a Sao Su Min Zhu. It's four characters. It was made of putting two words together. Sao Su means a little count in number, while the Min Zhu could be referred to all human collectives, such as the nation, ethnicities, people, and so on. In everyday usage, however, Min Zhu means two things, nation and the 56 nationalities classified by the state along with ethnic line. Nationality is used to translate Min Zhu. So there, there were um, 56 nationalities in China. Uh, Stephen Hero, however, suggests that it is uh, better to leave Min Zhu in the Western language uh, without the translation when referring to 56 nationalities. He thinks that Minzu cannot be understood as a nationality. Many Chinese scholars have uh, kept use of uh, minority nationality when referring to the 56, but the hero's suggestion seems to be accepted by many. The notion of the Sao Minzu has a long history, could be traced back to the early 20th century. In general, Chinese scholars believe that the term was from Japan. Japanese put the different Chinese characters together to translate all terms used in the social sciences in the West. And the start at the turn of the 20th century, these terms were imported into China through overseas Chinese scholars and the students study in Japan. In Chinese, however, Sao Su doesn't carry any negative meaning, while in English, minority sometimes make people who are others regarded very uncomfortable. Min Zhu itself does not have any negative meaning either when applied to the certain groups or peoples. Nonetheless, putting two words together, makes difference. Why? To answer this question has to make a long 
history short. I argue that the minorization, minorization in the Chinese context in the Chinese context has resulted from the state social policy towards ethnic minority. It is an unintended consequence, however. The, the process of making minority nationality start soon after the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Before 1949, most people of ethnic minorities will live their life in their traditional ways of their own, not much touched by modernity. The areas of ethnic minorities were more, more often than not kept autonomy. Most of these areas were under controlled by the leadership of ethnic minorities there on. The traditional indirect rule was still practiced in many of these areas. Anyway, political practice in many of these areas was to a great degree maintaining ways from the days of later Imperial China. Soon after the People's Republic established, the state started looking for ethnic representation because it was a state that the state is of the people, so the power must be shared by all peoples. None of this, how many ethnic groups in the country were unknown. And this was unacceptable, unacceptable unacceptable uh, to the state since the PRC was ongoing of the state making. The main government body, People's Congress, was ongoing in, in making to know how many ethnicities is important to the system. To, uh, this is the first reason why the People's Republic of China had to carry out the campaign of ethnic identification. Second, the Chinese Communist Party had had to keep promise to the people, such as if attained the power, the new regime would certainly bring benefits of any sort to the people. Uh, there was an article in uh, published in the 19, 1998, I I I think, uh, by uh, a friend of mine, Zhang Xiaowei. Uh, this, this article is about. It's, it's, a typ it's a typical about, uh, about this issue. So the, you, can, you can read the article, you can, you can find that in the many minority areas, the people in power, all minorities themselves. Because uh, in a long march, when the uh, uh, Chinese uh, communist, communist uh, Red Army uh, went through there, they, have, they had to uh, get a, uh, con contact with minority minority leadership to allow uh, you know to have to have have their permit to go, to go in through. So this why they 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 just make make some uh, commitment to to say that you know if we got power you you will you will you will be benefit you will be uh, you know benefit or some something like that. Mm. The third reason is, is, of course, about the issue of so how can these people get better controlled. This is essentially about the question whether or not are these people trustworthy. This, is, this question is actually a legacy from the uh, Republic era. How could this question have come about was against, uh, was against the backdrop of Sino Japanese War has taken place in, uh, during the 1931 to 45. During this period, the question of how to deal with ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities concerned academia and the policymakers. There were a few reasons related to one another for the question emerged. First, the most of these people have traditionally not lived in the Chinese proper, but in the frontiers. This situation may have led to some problems taking place. Second, ethnic minorities were easy to get in touch with the imperialist Soviet Russia and Japan were active in respectively Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia. 
but they were socially and economically backward and so were easy to be deceived by those foreigners so may go on to betray china accordingly it, it is urgent to improve the livelihood of ethnic minorities who were living in the volunteer areas and to develop the school education as well these scholars and the policy makers believe that they, they are uh, they are most important way to ensure people's loyalty to renaissance after communist communist attend the power this uh, republic legacy was succeed several ethnic ethnic minorities were therefore considered to be untrust untrusty that should be ruled differently than others in order to know how many uh ethnicities uh, how many ethnicities start with the first state census took place in the in in the early 1953 the government allowed people to indicate whatever they ident uh, their identity are in the end there were more than 400 identities turns out this was unacceptable because uh, it is the uh, uh, technique impossible for state to provide so many representative states in the people's congress the other reason is that many identities recognized were not ethnic were not ethnic but the place or something else some scholars also said that some claim to to hold on to different identities are actually the same same people the state urgently operated in its bureaucratic treatment, deciding to sort out these identities. This work has been called the Minzu Shibie, uh, ethnic identification. Almost uh, right after census, the government organized investi investigating investigating teams. Con consist of countries, scholars, artists, musicians, filmmakers, uh, general, uh, general, journalists uh, to form uh, to uh, to go to different minority minority areas to uh, carry out uh, ethnic identification. The campaign went through more than th uh, three decades, from 1953 to 87. There was a 10 years, 1966 to 76. The work was started due to the Cultural Revolution. By 1987, the government announced that ethnic identification was no longer carried on. Ethnicities was thus fixed in the number of 56, including the high majority. Because after open reform, police carry out and many many people found that as an ethnic minority they can get they can get many benefits for example going to going to universities they don't have they don't have to match the standard like a majority han student have to and also if they have their own uh, factories or they own any kind of business uh, they can they can uh, stay that can waive their uh, uh, first three years waive their tax of first three years or some, something like this and also they're very easy to get loan from the, from the state so uh, many people they just want to be want to want to become uh, ethnic minorities at that time so many 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 people even many Han Chinese people uh, you know, try to change their status, become become an ethnic minority. It's it's kind of interesting, and a lot of stories are very fun, funny at that time. <clears throat> uh, how could those people are uh, categorized? In other words, depending on what they were categorized, Joseph Stalin's definition of nation is referential. A framework, but the never be depends on. Uh, since what Stalin defined is nation, many scholars they still think at the late time Chinese carry out ethnic identification was uh, was based on Stalin's definition of nation. But uh, according to uh, the scholars who were participant in the 
investigation in uh, identification, they said that actually Stalin's definition name never get a play, uh, uh, never get a pride because uh, because it's impossible to to use it. However, it is uh, it is a referential framework. <clears throat> Linguistics and history were important that helped to help to incorporation of many in one. Uh, people's people's ethnic con consciousness at that time there was no concept or idea such as ethnic identity in uh, Chinese. <clears throat> people's uh, people's ethnic consciousness uh, is, is the important issue in uh, identification. Characterization of a population along ethnic line is usually in association with the production of knowledge of its ethnic identification assigned by the state in order to legitimate these categories, because inevitably uh, they would be they would become ethnic status ascribed to the peoples. <clears throat> so the project too is different. Uh, five years later, after ethnic identification launched in the 1953, there was the other campaign coming about. This is a so-called social historical investigation of ethnic minorities, the, investiga the investigation was running through 1958 to 64. The effects of this campaign in, minor, in minorization of ethnic minorities have not been enough recognized in academia so far. Uh, I, I argue it is the campaign opening way on which ethnic minorities in China went on minorized and for uh, Marginalized. At some point, I just draw uh, draw on my article published in uh, ethnic and racial studies many years ago, but I think now still makes sense. So let me outline a few points here. It was the first time the state produced knowledge of each minority nationality identified by the state. Second, the data collected through the social history project had to be sought out to fit into Marxist five-state model of social development in order to establish a hierarchical structure in which each, each separate minority nationality will have its social positions in uh, social positions congruent with the stages of primitive slave or uh, feudal society. By the time of uh, democratic reform, uh, after 1949 and 1953, uh, government carried out a movement, a political movement, so-called uh, democratic reform. Uh, so, so by the time, uh, so the, each group, they, they, they just, uh, you know, uh, it's a time point. So their situation just stop there. So, I don't know if I, uh, if my explanation is clear. <clears throat> Third, as a, as a consequence, all ethnic minorities are arranged, arranged on a row path or button of a totem pole of a social development. The majority hand is on the top. A hierarchical brotherhood was thus constructed, and the Han, the most advanced in every aspect, should be the oldest brother to other nationalities, so to have duty to help them. First, in association with the result from the social, social historical investigation, a preferential social policy towards ethnic nationalities was carried out, the most backward get the, get the most, and so on and so forth. The historical, the historical, the historical graphy of minority nationality was thus defined. Even today, after ethnic tourism has become a flourishing industry, 
and a way to make money in several places or representations about the ethnic minorities, no matter where they are in museums, theme park, TV programs, or films, must emphasize the theme of the social development in the first place, even though the details of how issues issues of ethnicity are presented may be different from those of the past in, uh, in some respect, aspect. Uh, traditionally, to obtain uh, the cognition from outside, a Chinese descent group had to establish a link to some higher power. In the same way today, the minority nationality in China can only have its legitimacy uh, recognized through the joint family of the Chinese nation, the so-called Zhonghua Minzu. However, <laughs> the members in this family form a linear uh, hierarchical structure. The past was spatially manifested in the present in, in a way through which modernism typically creates its others, such as uh, uh, traditional uh, primitive savage uh, uh, and Babylonian for the purpose of uh, defining modernity. <laughs> In the Chinese context, the party state used a notion of advanced or backward, uh, a synchronic uh, embodiment of uh, chronological to create these others, so to include all of them within the construction of the Chinese nation in which all different groups or people become brothers, at least in theory. In sum, based on the ethnic identification campaign and the project of investigation, uh, social history of the ethnic minorities that took place in the 1950s, ways of representation of ethnic minorities and the systematic body of knowledge about the minority people were established. In this process, the state, of course, wanted to show its benevolent base set, its discourse of advanced and backward have impact on every aspect of cultural production. As a result, therefore, ethnic minorities are more often than not being portrayed to be a familiarized, childlike, economically backward, and culturally romantic. After decades of knowledge production, ordinary people in China have been impressed to form their stereotype about ethnic minorities, Minzu, or minority nationalities. Ethnic minority in China were less minorized. Okay, that's all. Here's my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Bye now. Thank you, Ricardo. So that is the last of our presentations. I'm struck by uh, the ways in which across all of these we're really looking at state making projects in the context of modernity historically located projects in which the individual body is connected to the collective body is subjected to a variety of regimenting techniques some of them violent as claudia pointed out some of them soft power uh, through various pedagogies of citizenship in which education of, ch of children and immigrants plays an important role. Um, exactly the things that Kefan said about the feminization, exoticization, objectification of minorities in China could be said about Francophones in Canada today. Uh, there's so many things that are that are that run through the um, all of the of the uh, presentations, issues of trust. Are you in the state? Are you not in the state? Um, questions also of um, kind of organic uh, notions of identity of the collective body and the individual body. These themes seem to come back over and over and over again. And we keep coming back to the state one way or the other. So we have some time for, um, for discussion, for questions.
Uh, Ricardo, can you uh, man the chat? Person the chat, look at the chat, take care yes, of the chat. I'm here. <laughs> okay. I'm here. Um, oh. So um, feel free to put things uh, in the chat, but also if there's anybody, maybe through us, the hands up function, um, if anybody would like to make a comment, raise a question, the floor is open. And that includes the participants, of course. So I'm going to try to start things off. And actually, I want to go back to Claudia, if I may, um, to ask you, um, and one of the themes also that I forgot to mention that you raised was the role of anthropologists in making the knowledge. I think Kefan you know, really stressed how important it was to make knowledge in order for this object, the ethnic minority, to even exist. And you alluded to that, Claudia, uh, in the context of Brazil. Um, so I was wondering whether, I guess you might have, have something to say about that particular issue and perhaps Lionel in the context of Singapore, it would also be interesting to know uh, the extent to which linguists, historians, sociologists, anthropologists, which were the disciplines that were involved in the knowledge making that was necessary for policy. Alexandre, I don't know if you're with us or not, but there's kind of a thing in the background in the debates that you present, somebody thought they knew something about the question of minorities. What kind of bodies of knowledge were they drawing on and who was producing it? So maybe, I don't know, Claudia, would you mind starting off? Thank you, Monica. First of all, thank you for the call to my colleagues for this wonderful panel. Really, I think it's inspired a lot of us. Um, uh, I will say actually fairly obvious that the anthropologists in the beginning, uh, there were uh, agencies, the Society for the Protection of Indians, where sort of the new, uh, the first generations of anthropologists were brought in and explorers and people like Marichal Hongdong were uh, brought in to make contacts and basically to be tutors of the, um, minority uh, Indian indigenous groups, which are many, because they were considered ill prepared to be assimilated into the nation, etc. And so the power was handed over, as we call, to, to this fraternal protection. I was struck also by Kifan in China, this idea of the big brothers helping people to find their way into the nation and still the trope of assimilation that's also about the UN policy that was uh, described here how much the idea of civilization uh, and one nation and bringing everybody into the fold was uh, at the high point at the mid of the last century now it's evident it, since our uh, new constitution, but throughout the whole world, the whole idea of self-determination and the exploding of the idea of exactly what is development, what is evolution, where do people go, and and how do we get off speaking for other people, changed anthropology radically after the uh, 1980s, and, and we tried to introduce this into the government institutions because the idea is nobody's to speak for the Indians, the indigenous people, they speak for themselves. And nowadays we've got lots of indigenous students in the anthropology pro programs. I'm not sure that's a solution, but anyway, this whole idea of self-determination is a threat to modernity is a, a thorn in a way in the side of the um, unified NED national project, or it can be, and that's something that we deal with today. Thank you. Lionel? Lionel, can you hear me? No? Okay, we'll try to get back to you. 
Uh, I'm trying to unmute and it's very slow to respond. Am I unmuted now? Can people hear? Yeah. Me? Now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So just two quick points. One, I think uh, uh, the the language policy and the, the associated mother tongue policy in Singapore is very much uh, uh, formulated by uh, our first prime minister's uh, beliefs about language identity and ethnicity, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. And in his memoirs, he makes it very clear that uh, in trying to understand uh, how to manage ethnic diversity, he read a lot of works from, uh, I think, anthropology. And uh, one of the things I remember from reading his memoirs was what he uh, thought of as uh, a sense of uh, primordialism. So his reading, selective or otherwise, of the anthropological academic literature at the time convinced him that uh, everybody has a primordial desire to make sure that their ethnic identity is properly recognized. And to try to deny that or to try to squash it down will only at some point lead to unrest and some kind of fermentation of a, a revolution down the road, which is why uh, he was very uncomfortable with the Bumi Putra policy in the Federation of Malaysia, where the whole idea was that ethnic Malays should have special privileges and rights. And when Singapore became independent, his conviction was that the only way for Singapore to avoid any kind of uh, ethnic unrest was to assure all the major ethnic groups that they will, be, they will all be in equal status. So the, the, the policy itself is very much influenced by his reading of uh, anthropological literature and he was very much taken with this whole idea of a, a sense of primordial identity which cannot be denied and has to be given equal space alongside other identities. The other point I want to make then is that in the, certainly from my own experience, when um, English became a lot more commonly used in Singapore, the government did express a lot of concern about the, the nativized variety of English, Singlish, and how this was, for the government's perspective, uh, not proper English and would compromise people's ability to learn standard proper English, which they felt was important for being globally uh, competitive. So they tried to get the uh, academics, particularly linguists, to help out with their speak good English movement. Uh, and I agreed to be part of that uh, committee because I felt there was one way to at least educate uh, the government uh, about some of its uh, ideologies and assumptions regarding language. But going back to, I think, maybe a point that uh, Alexandra might have made uh, with the United Nations, I quickly realized that even though I was on the committee for about nine years, I think, and over that nine years, I was gratified in the sense that I was consistently interacting with the senior civil servants who were tasked with uh, running the Speak Good English movement year after year. Gradually, over time, they came to understand some of the nuances and complexities of our language and identity. But I also became very aware that the people I was educating or speaking to were the senior servant servants, not the ministers themselves, not the policy makers. So even as the senior civil service became more and more appreciative that this whole idea of Singlish is bad, standard English is good, the two are clearly demarcated and one uh, is going uh, to be only uh, around at the expense of the other, that this would overly simplify the whole complex nature of social linguistics. Uh, these were not the people who actually ultimately held the power to influence policy. So the policy itself remains unchanged because where the ministers themselves are concerned, their assumptions about language, about identity, about ethnicity uh, were not going to be, I think, challenged or, or educated in any way over time. So that's all. Thanks. Yeah, and I think, well, I mean, you, po you point out obviously that the kinds of regimentation of bodies that we were talking about earlier applies to the regimentation of language as well. So very clearly, um, but also that there seems to be a strongly hegemonic set of ideologies which are historically new in some sense, but yet are treated as primordial uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and universal. Alexandre, mm -hmm. are you here? It looks like his image froze. <laughs> well, oh. he's, he looks frozen. <laughs> Sometimes he's there and sometimes he's not. 
Alexandre, est-ce que tu es capable d'intervenir? He's not there. Not But there. We, can, we, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to take some time to, to read it to everyone. Uh, this is from John V, who is joining us. I, I don't know from where, but he, he asked, like, does the minority majority bifurcation take enforcement as well as construction? Is there is this relationship between maintaining the construction as it cannot be just made, but regularized, normalized? Who would like to respond? You know, So I think both Lionel and, and Claudia, I think both of you have said things about, I think Claudia, you referred to overt violence at one point. Um, Lionel, you talked about policy, which I think is, uh, you know, one can understand as a form of, of policing. Uh, I guess, you know, the question is, how do we understand that, that policing? Certainly, I, you know, I would say that in, you know, in my own work, what I've seen is policing ranging from the the everyday people telling each other the right way to be we can think about you know socialization of children um about uh you know telling people you can't you can't sit this way you can't talk that way you can't be this way you can't dress this way uh in everyday life ranging to the kinds of policy um, structures which might delimit, for example, who can go to what school or who can live where. So um, I don't know, you know, Lionel or, or Claudia, if you, there are particular examples that you want to talk about or anybody else. Um, from... uh, yeah, I, I, I think I can talk about two quick examples. I'm not sure you'll answer the question, but I think I can think of two examples in Singapore life uh, where this whole idea of uh, minority, But remember, in, in Singapore, what has happened is that you have different ethnic groups, which are minority or majority based on the fact that they have different percentages in the overall population. So the Chinese being 75.9% or so will be the majority. But the official discourse in public life has always been that all the ethnic groups are of equal status. So this in some sense has led especially for, I think, a number of younger Singaporeans nowadays, to a, a kind of situation where they, when they look at this attempt to make sure that all the minority groups are given equal status and representation, a kind of almost a cynical reaction uh, to this. Because certainly when I was growing up and until today, when you have official gatherings, official events, there is what people refer to as a CMIO model the Chinese, Malay, Indian, others model. In other words, when you have, let's say, a, an official event, then there is an attempt, it's almost like a tokenism. There's an attempt to make sure that at each member of the C, the M, the I, and the O is represented on stage. So it becomes almost a kind of tokenism you find in schools that you find in uh, you know, um, neighborhood festivals organized by the government where they try to ensure or remind everybody that these ethnic groups are all of equal status. But the contrast with that is in the government's housing policy. So in the government's housing policy, what has happened is that they've got an ethnic quota, uh, uh, well, uh, an ethnic quota requirement. So in, in public housing, for example, the government wants to make sure that you don't end up with ethnic enclaves. So you don't up with a, end up with a neighborhood that's only Chinese or a, a, a block of flats that is only Malay. So they want to make sure that these are as ethnically diverse as possible. So uh, it's almost a form of recursivity if you go back to some of the terms used in anthropological linguistics about making sure that what happens at one particular scale is also reproducible at a smaller scale. So the diversity you find at the level of the nation is hopefully reproduced at the neighborhood level as well. So the way they do that is to say, if, if, for example, I live in a public housing flat. So as a Chinese, who's a member of the majority group, if I decide to sell my flat, I can sell my flat or my apartment to another Chinese, or I can sell it to a Malay or an Indian, because 
being a majority, if I if one let more Chinese moved out and it was replaced by a Malay or a Chinese, a Malay or Indian family, it wouldn't disrupt the majority minority status. So I'm fortunate in the sense I can sell my apartment to a member of any ethnic group. The problem then is that if I was a member of the minority ethnic group, let's say I was an Indian and I wanted to sell my apartment, I could only sell it to another Indian. Because if I were to sell it to a Chinese, that would raise the majority of the Chinese and further deplete what is already a minority. So that creates a big problem in terms of marketability and, and ability to profit from your property. And Indian can only sell to another Indian. So the Indian buyer or potential buyer knows that he or she is in a particularly strong position to uh, make a, a lower price because the seller would not have that many people that they could potentially sell to. So, so in some see. sense, yeah, in, in the policy and in the public performances, etc., you have a degree of tokenism, but then you also have this very clear uh, well, policing of who can sell what to whom based on their ethnic identities in public housing anyway. So what's impressive is that the policing takes a huge number of forms and it affects everyday life in, in these complex ways, but it's also obviously really hard to do. The making people fit into their categories isn't so, you know, despite all of the beliefs about primordialism and naturalism, there's a whole lot of work that has to go on into the mind, the most minute details. Uh, Alexandre, are you... You with us can yes i'm 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 here uh my internet is uh completely and yeah you could try also using the chat that might be better yeah we've lost you again um uh, ricardo i think there's uh, there are more um questions in the chat should we move to those yes um, I will, here we have a couple of comments. Um, Francine, can we say a word about the non-ethnic minorities at the time of intersectional atmosphere? And Virginia, hello. Oh, there you are. I see you. Uh, she's also asking. I think that the question is very interesting. It asks about maintenance and not just initial construction. Carmen from Brazil. Lionel, you said there is an obligation to choose one ethnic group. Hybrid ethnicity are forbidden. My question is if gender plays a role in the choice, the mother of or the father ethnicity are choose or chosen preferentially. And Gordon Matthews here also, uh, the state seems considerably more successful in minorization policies in Singapore and China than in Western societies. Is this indeed the case in terms of these policies seeming legitimate, or is this not the case? Well, the questions are on in the, in, in the chat. So, um, so perhaps I just say a word. Yeah, Monica. Ah, yeah. Anyway, I was thinking the question about regularization. I think um, what this wonderful laboratory of Singapore and Malaysia it shows us also is how. There's not much difference between construction and maintenance. I mean, you're constantly reconstructing uh, the whole idea of minority and through regulations, how much this <laughs> moves us beyond. But I wanted to uh, add about the non ethnic minorities eventually that Virginia asked about, um, because I was thinking very much, we talked about how the nation state is trying constantly to use the different sorts of Pacific uh, pedagogical devices to bind people into the nation and teach proper uh, behaviors. And at the same time, how it, the whole colonial legacy and we, the way we make a hierarchy, establish a moral uh, hierarchy of differences, of different ways of being, of different sorts of families, etc. And I, I'm always um, fascinated talking about intersectionality of the way in uh, North America and the Northern Hemisphere, the uh, poor families who have had their children removed against their will, and those who have had 
uh, success in resisting are exactly those people that have um, organized in ethnic movements, the indigenous movement and the black families. Black families matter. So as long as you're in some kind of non-standard behavior, and rather than being alcoholic or poor or anything else like that, which are obviously put on the lower rung of evolutionary uh, scales, if you can squeeze into the politically uh, potent categories of certain minorities, like Black families and like Indigenous movements, then people are able to resist against these normal tools of government that are used to tutor their lives from the beginning to the end. And so that's what I would add. Thank you. Lionel? Uh, Carmen had a very specific question for you. Yes, could I get a reminder of what the question was? So the question... Oh, sure, here it is. Lionel, you said there is an obligation to choose one ethnic group. Hybrid ethnicity are forbidden. My question is if gender plays uh, a role um, in choice. Uh, the mother or the okay. father ethnicity well, are chosen preferentially. That's Carmen's question. Okay, so uh, what I want to clarify is that it's not that hybrid ethnicities are forbidden, right? It's that hybrid ethnicities are interpreted as not purely hybrid in the sense that X dash Y, the sequence is important because it's not the same as Y dash X. So again, the government recognizes that there will be children of uh, mixed parentage. Let's say again, a child of a uh, Chinese and Malay parents, but whether the child decides to identify as Chinese Malay or Malay Chinese, that becomes critical. So we can contrast, I think, two different phases. Before hybridity becomes officially recognized or became officially recognized, I think gender became gender was an important factor in the sense that um, ethnic identity was arrived at based on the father's ethnicity. So the mother's ethnic identity was certainly not as important. So a child of uh, Malay, whose father is Malay and the mother is Chinese, would automatically be classified as Malay following the father's ethnic identity. If the child came from a Chinese father and a Malay mother, the child would be classified as Chinese, again, based on the father's ethnicity. So this was a period before hybridity was taken seriously. It's simply Everybody has one ethnic identity, and that one identity, ethnic identity really derives from the father's ethnic identity. With hybridity, what happens then is that the government has said to many Singaporeans, if you come from mixed parentage, you can decide which you want, how you want to be identified. If you want to be identified as Malay Chinese, that's not the same as being identified as Chinese Malay. So in this case now, gender becomes less important in the sense that the child makes a decision regardless of whether it's the father or mother, but simply because whether the child wants to be seen as Malay, Chinese or Chinese Malay. But we go back in many ways still to the idea that a person who comes from a mixed background is still obligated to say what their dominant identity is. They have to make that particular choice. So in a newspaper report a couple of years ago, what was very interesting was that they featured a young uh, female Singaporean student who she said she was trying to make a decision whether she wanted to be officially recognized as Malay Chinese or Chinese Malay. She was worried if she chose one or the other, she might end up uh, hurting the feelings of either her mother or her father because one would be the dominant identity and the other wouldn't. But then she also said, and this is the part that I found very interesting. She then said that in the end, she will make a decision about whether to be classified as Malay Chinese and hence primarily Malay or Chinese Malay and hence primarily Chinese based on what she thought might be funding opportunities from the various uh, ethnic health groups. So if she thought she could get more, let's say, scholarships or bursaries from the Malay uh, Association, 
then she might she thought it was useful then to be officially seen as Malay Chinese. But if she thought she could get more benefits from being seen as Chinese, then she might classify herself as Chinese Malay. So it goes down to a very pragmatic, almost uh, playing the system kind of mentality. And in many ways, that also avoids her putting, putting her in a difficult position of maybe hurting her mother or her father's feelings because her uh, answer would be, I'm not making a decision based on whether I feel closer to my mom or to my dad, but simply in terms of what kinds of financial and, and maybe other kinds of benefits might accrue from that particular choice. I'm sorry, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to jump in very quickly because uh, Moxie has a, a comment about what just Lionel was mentioning. And Moxie, well, I know he's there, but I'm going to read it if, if, if he doesn't mind. Is that he says, what Lionel, what Lionel has just said about ethnic identity being traced from fathers begs questions about the ethnic identity of a bilateral descent group, which includes children of different gender siblings. Well, there's Moxie. <laughs> so if I'm, I'm just going to jump in because I see that we're, we're losing participants. We have maybe, you know, it's a few minutes left. Um, and I just wanted to open up. There was a question of Francine's that got lost in the in the shuffle. So maybe, um, and Alexandre excuses himself. He keeps getting bounced off the Zoom, and so we can't even follow the debate. And so it's impossible for him to... Uh, to comment. So what I'm, I'm wondering is uh, whether, maybe I'll make one one um, comment here about Francine is, I think, indirectly pointing out the fact that we have ended up talking about nation, race, ethnicity, uh, and the gendered dimensions of that sort of notion of, of, uh, of, of lineage or genealogy, but there are other for, there are other categories that are involved in processes of, of minorization and ones that have been um, sort of, you know, discussed uh, categorizations of gender sexuality uh, and others that have been um, problematized partly through the notion of intersectionality, but also just problematized as, as uh, you know, as as the unclear boundaries that we have been saying they are. Um, so I think that that's a useful comment for us to bear in mind when we talk about minorization and minorization, we seem, you know, because we were talking about this as a state project, we end up kind of going in one particular direction of what kinds of categories we're talking about, but maybe we need to open that up uh, a bit more broadly. Um, I think, um, Ricardo, I'm going to suggest that we maybe we've gone for almost two hours now. Uh, maybe we should wrap up. I'll give uh, maybe one last word to, to Claudia and, and Lionel, and then um, we, can, we can talk about the next webinar in January, just to let people know. How does that sound? Claudia, any comment you'd like to make? Oh, just to say thank you, and it's been a great pleasure, and I hope to continue this dialogue in the future. Thanks. And Lionel? Um, yeah, pretty much the same. I don't think I've got any more to say. I, I would just say that uh, maybe I feel somewhat, it's a bit ironic perhaps, I feel somewhat fortunate to be living in a society that is so overly concerned with social engineering and the regimentation that uh, basically the the research site is outside my doorstep each time I leave the apartment. <laughs> well, I think I would say that the research site is outside all of our doorsteps. It may be more evident uh, in some places than others, but it, it sounds to me certainly from this, uh, this set of discussions that we're all dealing with, to the extent to which the state is the kind of canonical uh, political governance form in modernity you know, that we have, uh, we're all dealing with this one way or another. Um, so thank you uh, and and thank you in absentia to Alexandre and to Kefan for their very, very useful uh, uh, participation. Uh, Ricardo or Carmen, do you wanna say a word about the next webinar coming up in January? Maybe Carmen? Carmen. Yeah webinar on gender and sexuality and you are all welcome to be to participate on it we'll have uh, colleagues from brazil the 
uh, Gregory, uh, Friends, uh, Eric uh, Fassin, and others. We will let this in suspense. We look forward. It's January 30th, right? Or, or 31st. Yeah. And, and those who are here, well, seeing us, hearing us, just a quick reminder that to share the information when we start posting, we're trying to post and to disseminate the information about the, these webinars with WCA and you know, two different languages and experimenting with videos. So it is actually very uh, fulfilling uh, hearing and seeing new ways of transmitting information. So please, if you can help us uh, share and spread the word with your students, with your friends, with your colleagues, and in all social uh, media platforms. Thank you. Okay, so we could stop recording. And thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.